Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. Today we've got James Krieger on the show. James has a master's degree in both nutrition and exercise science and currently runs a super successful and resourceful website, weightology.net. Thanks for joining us, James. Yeah, thanks for having me. So before we dig into our topic today, man, can you give folks a bit of background on how you got into this evidence-based health and fitness stuff to begin with? Well, I've always been a scientist at heart. So, I mean, I actually started my career in computer science, but then, you know, kind of had a career change. And so I've always been interested in research and science and I'm always, so I've always been kind of a data evidence-based person, you know, if so, you know, and especially in the fitness industry, there's just so many people that make so many claims and statements and things like that. And if somebody's going to tell me something, I'm going to ask them, where, where's the evidence for that? You know, if you're going to tell me, you tell me that this is true, uh, I want to see your evidence. And I, I mean, people just people just make stuff up like all the time uh, in this industry, and it just drives me nuts. You know, so it's so true. And I think um, what uh, just as a side note, if somebody's going to make a claim, the burden is on them to provide the proof for it, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, so as far as neat goes, getting into our topic for the people that aren't familiar with it, can you just give it a little bit of, give us a little bit of a breakdown on what neat is? Yeah. So neat, uh, refers to, um, something called non-exercise activity thermogenesis. That's what it, it's an acronym for that. And it just refers to your physical activity throughout the day other than formal exercise. So everything from walking to your car to even the movement of your mouth, talking, to fidgeting, to even just, you know, maintaining your posture, all of that physical activity, that's all physical activity. And that all falls under the, the neat umbrella. And so um, really the majority of your physical activity, energy expenditure, even in someone who exercises a lot, um, majority of your physical activity, energy expenditure actually comes from neat and not exercise. So, and would there be any exceptions to that rule? For example, an elite athlete that's you know playing in the NBA or NFL or something like that. Yeah, maybe like you know uh, you know elite endurance athletes who are training with massive volumes, things like that. Um, you know, their physical activity, energy expenditure from exercise might be higher. Or you know, competitive swimmers who are training you know ridiculous four hours a day, you know, morning and night and stuff like that. Um, but, but, but for most people, you know, for general population, uh, meat makes up the biggest component of your physical activity, energy expenditure. Okay, cool. So is there a natural or a genetic component to how much someone may or may not involuntarily move throughout the day? Oh yeah, there's a huge genetic component. In fact, um, you know, there's research to show, uh, both, uh, we know what happens in rodents. What, what's interesting is you can take rodents and you can actually breed them to be physically active or sedentary. Like what's really interesting. So like, you know, if you take a mouse and you put it on a wheel, some mice will run on the wheel and other mice will just sit there and not do anything. And you can breed the mice to be that way, which indicates there is a genetic biological drive to physical activity. And, and we know that also translates to humans. We know, um, physical activity and neat levels tend to cluster in human families. Um, I know just for myself, I'm quite a fidgeter and my whole family is like that. My brother is that way. My, my father is that way as well. So there's obviously a genetic component there. Um, so yeah, so, there, so people have different inherent drives to be physically active. And, and we even see that in, in studies. Um, uh, one famous study done all the way back in the 1980s, uh, had people confined to a small room, um, and the researchers just wanted to look at uh, the variation in physical activity from one person to the next. Um, and these are people confined to a small room, so there was, you know, there was no exercise going on. They didn't have much room to move around, um, and there was still a huge variation from one person to the next in how uh, spontaneously active they were. And it actually amounted um, anywhere from, you know, I think the, on the very low end. You know, one person expended maybe around 140 calories a day, and on the high end, someone expended maybe 640 calories per day in physical activity. So that's a 500 calorie per day difference uh, in terms of range, uh, which is a huge amount uh, just for spontaneous activity and things like that. So, so yes, there is definitely a genetic component there. Yeah, that's massive. 500 calories is huge. So, can you touch on how? our current environment or technology and the way that's set up impacts our need on a daily basis? 
Uh, oh yeah, it. I mean, everything basically encourages less neat from. <laughs> You know, you know, taking escalators versus stairs or elevators, you know, um, you know, we take our cars everywhere. Um, everybody has desk jobs now, you know, computer work. Uh, um, everything in our society is basically it's like we've engineered our environment. So that has basically resulted in very low neat levels. So. Right. Yeah. And I I guess even thinking about sitting on a couch, I mean, it's so much more work to sit on the ground and change positions and all that sort of stuff. And that's just something super minor, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it all adds up, you know, you know, those, those little bits of physical activity, if you look at them in isolation, you're not talking very much, but when you accumulate it through an entire day, um, it actually makes a big difference. So that's a great point, man. Now, we're in the midst of an obesity epidemic. So how much of this issue would you say is related to decreased NEAT levels according to the research? So it's really difficult to say. I, I will say this. There's a lot of evidence that people's tendencies to gain weight, you know, some people gain weight much easier than others. Um, there is evidence to suggest that's partly related to NEAT levels. So people who have naturally high NEAT levels are more resistant to weight gain, Um, you know, because I think it's because their energy expenditures, their physical activity energy expenditures are much higher. um, And so it gives them kind of a buffer, even if even if they do overeat, you know. So um, now, how much does it contribute to the obesity epidemic? I would say if you look from, you know, around 1980 to close to 2000, Um, when the obesity epidemic was really exploding, most of the data suggests that physical activity did not play a strong role in that. Most of it was just due to changes in our diet. However, if you look beyond the year 2000 and on, um, which is, um, you, you, there is now, uh, you know, well, let me put it this way. If you look between 1980 and 2000, physical activity levels actually stayed relatively constant, um, in the United States, at least. Um, there was, they didn't really decrease much, but if you look at from 2000 on, there was a definite drop off in physical activity. So I would definitely, I would say that the evidence does support a role of physical activity and lower neat levels within the past, you know, few decades. Um, and I would say that's likely because, you know, if you think about it, probably the late nineties, um, is really where I would say the tech industry and computers and everything really kind of took off. I mean, uh, I mean, we all know about the internet bubble of the late nineties, right? I mean, I mean, so I would say that's, that's where you started to see more and more people really having desk jobs, things like that. And then you started to see the decline in physical activity. So, um, so I'd say in the past few decades, I, I would say the, the loss in need has probably played a stronger role than it did. I'd say, you know, when the obesity epidemic first started, um, now there's another component I do want to note there though. Um, sometimes you can't necessarily separate physical activity from energy intake. And the reason I say that is there's evidence to show that people who are inactive don't regulate their calorie intake as well. Like their brains don't do as good of a job of sensing, you know, when you're overeating or when you're not. Um, so there's also some evidence that some of the overeating that we've experienced could be tied into a uh, loss of physical activity, you know, just some of the appetite dysregulation that comes from inactivity. So, so there is that component. You can't necessarily s- always separate the two. Um, uh, but I, I would, you know, t- I would reiterate, yeah, I would say physical activity certainly has played a role in the past few decades. No matter what, diet is still going to, p- still plays the strongest role. Um, just from a, you know, just when you think about it in terms of calories, it's it's way, way easier to eat 200 calories than it is to expend 200 calories. So um, so no matter what, you know, the diet is still always going to play the biggest role. But that's not to say that NEAT does, doesn't play a role, and especially on an individual basis, you know, people's individual tendencies to, to gain or lose weight. So. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, man. That leads me into my next question. That's a, there's a little bit of overlap there, but something I've noticed with my personal coaching clients is how neat impacts food intake, and then how food impact or food intake impacts neat. So, for example, if 
less movement literally gives folks more time to sit around and consume calories. And yes. then also they're not burning them. And then also neat and just regular physical, physical activity seems to have an appetite regulating effect, which you touched on. And then it's funny because some folks seem to overeat at a meal and then feel the need, the natural need to move more. But then others might actually overeat to the point of feeling super full and then be even less likely to yeah. want to move. So what does the research say about that relationship? That, it's really hard to say. Um I haven't seen any data to look at those individual variances because I I would agree with you. That's something I've experienced with myself and my clients as well is, uh, yeah, some people when they overeat, um, they'll go and they'll burn it off, you know. Um, I, I'm actually probably one of those people where I, I know when I overeat, I've actually, um, I, I feel a need to move more, you know. Yeah, um, but but there are other people. Yeah, they, they just end up feeling sluggish and they want to sit around and things like that. So, um, so it's hard to say. I, I don't think it's really been investigated, to my knowledge, at least. Um, you know, what are the what are the reasons behind some of those individual differences? You know, so. Okay. Now, is there anything in the research about specific macronutrient breakdowns in the diet? So protein, carbs, and fat, and how that might play a role in those different ratios? Uh, right now, if you look at the evidence, the data doesn't seem to support any impact of macronutrient ratios on like meat levels. Um, that's not to say that in certain individuals, you couldn't have an impact. I mean, if someone changes their macro ratio and they just feel way better, they might end up being more active, you know. Uh, so, so that's not to say that it doesn't ever happen. But just if you look at group, you know, people on average, you know, which is what research usually looks at, is what what, what happens in you know groups of people and not individuals. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of support for you know variations in in physical activity from you know variations in in macro uh, nutrient intake. So. Yeah, and that totally makes sense if somebody feels better on a certain breakdown that they're going to move a little more, so that's a good point. Now, yeah. how does formal exercise impact meat levels? So, for example, you know, you see those trainers in the gym that just absolutely destroy their clients in a session and then the rest of the day that session is just or that person is more likely to sit down or just want to crash on the couch because they're so wiped. So, how should folks think about formal exercise sessions and and its relationship to meat? Yeah, so I always tell people, think of exercise as just another method for increasing your total daily energy expenditure. I mean, ignoring things like, obviously, like if you're doing things like weight training, you know, you're trying to build muscle and things like that. But but ignoring that component, really what you're trying to do is you're just trying to add to your daily energy expenditure. But if you train so hard that, yeah, maybe you expended, you know, 50 or 100 more calories in that session, but then now you're just so wiped that you sit around the rest of the day, you may have actually, you may have actually decreased your total daily energy expenditure. And in fact, there's some data that's, that where they've shown that, you know, um, um, or at the very worst, it didn't change or, you know, it didn't change. And so, so you busted your ass in the gym and, but if you're sedentary the rest of the day to compensate for it, um, from an energy expenditure standpoint, you didn't really give yourself any benefit, you know, now that's not to say you didn't give yourself some health benefits, you know, that, but that's a different, that's a different issue. But if you're just looking at, at it purely from a weight loss or fat loss perspective, it's all about trying to increase your total daily energy expenditure. And so that's why for my clients, you know, I, I like to have my clients do weight training to build muscle. And then for cardio, I tend to recommend low to moderate intensity so that they're just not wiped. That's, that doesn't mean I'm against interval training. Um, you know, there's some evidence that interval training can help suppress appetite, things like that. I mean, it really comes down to the individual. If someone feels great when they're doing interval training, then I encourage it. But, uh, but if someone's doing interval training and they're just trying to kick themselves in the ass so hard and then they're just wiped after the sessions, um, it's not going to do them a lot of good from a fat loss perspective. So, so, so you got to think about exercise is just one component to add to your overall daily energy expenditure. Um, and when you think about it in those terms, 
then you start thinking about what's happening through the entire day and not just what's happening in your exercise session. So you're thinking, okay, I did some exercise today, but I still have to be, be cognizant of how active I'm being through the rest of the day, right? I have to make sure I'm not compensating in other areas and being more sedentary. And, that, and then that's the way that you actually bump up your total daily energy expenditure. Yeah, that's an awesome breakdown, man. I think it's important for folks to be you know, active with an active lifestyle as opposed to quote-unquote active with a sedentary lifestyle. And then coming back to high-intensity stuff and appetite suppression, do we see appetite suppression um, in an acute sense or is it over the course of the whole day or how does that uh, pan out? Um, most of the evidence seems to say uh, show maybe acute appetite suppression. Um, whether it translates into uh, lower calorie intake across the day, there's some studies that say yes or some studies that say no. Um, there is a lot of variance between the studies, like the findings haven't been consistent. Um, personally, I think if you look at the weight of evidence, I say there's enough evidence to, to suggest that there is an appetite suppressant effect, um, at least on average. It's probably not going to happen in everybody. Um I know I'm one of those people, if I have a really hard session, I don't have an appetite, you know, yeah. um, you know, for a little while after the session. So, um, but I will say that most of the evidence seems to be, it seems to be relatively acute, um, doesn't necessarily last through the entire day. Although some studies that have tracked people's calorie intakes through the re- re- rest of the day have shown uh, sometimes you know a lower calorie intake anyway so meaning they're not compensating later in the day for it gotcha okay so we evolved in sort of a food scarce environment when where we expended a ton of calories just obtaining our food to begin with so we didn't really need to pay attention to our neat levels it's almost counterintuitive from an evolutionary perspective so Having said that, what is the best way for us to assess or track our NEAT levels outside of, you know, a metabolic ward setting, of course? Um, I always just recommend people to use either pedometers or activity trackers. I think that's the most the easiest way. And I always tell people, um, don't wear your activity tracker or your pedometer in your exercise sessions. You know, you're doing the exercise. You don't need the activity tracker in there. Um, the purpose of the activity tracker is to track your activity outside of your exercise sessions. You know, how active are you being the rest of the day? Um, and that's something I do with all my clients. You know, I want them, you know, I want to see higher step counts, things like that outside of their exercise sessions, because that tells me that they're maintaining fairly high activity levels throughout the day and not just in their exercise sessions, you know. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I guess if somebody's hitting a treadmill or something like that, they can sort of artificially bump up their steps and it looks like they moved a lot more in a general sense over the course of a day when they really haven't. Yeah, yeah. Do you get your clients to use, say, the calorie trackers on a treadmill? Because we know that their the calorie expenditure varies so much, but do you use that digit as say a tracking mechanism to say go in burn 200 calories and then we need to bump things up a week or two later so burn 300 or 400 do you use that measurement at all personally i don't because there's too much variation and there's too much error in the measurement and um and the thing is i don't know what's going on outside of the exercise session so even if i did go by that i you know i could sit there and think oh this person's burning you know expending this many calories um, but I don't know what they're doing the rest of the day. So um, it's just to me, it's not really useful. You know, um, um, if I'm going to try to progress a client, I'm just going to go off of, you know, things like, you know, like on a treadmill, I'll just be basically speed and, and grade, you know, okay. um, and I'll just, you know, if I'm looking to progress them and make things more challenging, I'll just do that. But, I, I, you know, I, I won't pay any attention to the to the actual um, energy expenditure estimates from uh, from any of those devices. So, okay, okay, cool. Do you recommend or sort of push folks towards going for a walk outdoors versus hitting the treadmill inside, or do you care about that sort of stuff? Um, personally, I don't really care. Um, you know, however people want to do it, whatever it's going to fit their lifestyle. You know, I mean, because not everybody lives in an environment where they can go outside all the time, you know, um, it's just some, for some people, it's just not going to be possible. So, um, 
so personally, I just say, you know what, Wh- whatever you're able to do, uh, whatever fits your lifestyle that's uh, and that y- you can adhere to and kind of be consistent with, um, then that's the way you should do it, you know? Okay, yeah, that totally makes sense from a practical standpoint. Now, what are some of the ways that the body internally or subconsciously reduces meat or just calorie expenditure in general? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say scientists don't really know the mechanisms very well. There's a lot. There's some hormones and things like that that have been found to regulate physical activity levels, like a, a hormone called orexin and things like that. Um, um, but we don't quite know what's going on. We just know that meat tends to go down when people lose weight. Um, and that's your body's way of trying to conserve energy. Um, so, so when you go on a diet, um, your body's going to do two things. First, it's going to jack up your appetite because it's going to try to get you to eat more. Um, and the other thing it's going to do is going to try to reduce your energy expenditure. And it'll do that through two ways. It'll decrease your metabolic rate. Um, but the change in metabolic rate isn't that isn't big enough to really make a huge difference in terms of your weight loss. Um, but what can make a difference is the, is the reduction in NEAT. And so, um, so your body's going to try to reduce its NEAT levels. You, you may end up fidgeting less or moving around less, and you may not even be aware of it because um, your body's trying to conserve energy. And then there's also evidence that your body actually even becomes more efficient for the same movement. So, um, you know, if you burn, you know, 10 calories to work, walk from t- point A to point B, um, now you might only burn seven calories, you know, the same thing. So, so you be- become more efficient for the exact same uh, movement. So, so those are all the various ways your body tries to resist uh, weight loss. Um, and so that's why it's really important to try to keep your neat levels and physical activity levels up um, to try to at least partly counteract that. Right. Now you alluded to this, but how much, how much, if at all, does the metabolism actually slow when somebody loses weight? And then how much of that slowing is actually a result of the metabolism itself versus burning less calories because you're moving less and also just carrying less physical weight around is going to be less work? Yeah. So it's a combination of both. I mean, part of it is just because, yeah, you got less weight to carry around. Um, but even if you adjust for that, um, you know, you control for the, the change in body weight. Um, there's a reduction in resting metabolic rate by maybe if you were to look at it in terms of numbers, maybe around a hundred calories per day. So not a huge amount. I mean, certainly not enough to really stop your weight loss. You know, hundred calories isn't that much. So the reduction in need though, that can be much higher. I mean, there's some research studies showing reductions in need of around, 500 calories per day or so uh, when people diet and and that's a very that's a fairly large amount so so the, the the good thing about that is that's something that you know we can't control our metabolisms as much as people like Jillian Michaels and people like that <laughs> will tell you that you can eat this way or do this and you'll 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 boost your metabolism you can't really there's really not much you can do about your metabolism you can't really change it um you can't stop the decrease in metabolic rate that happens with weight loss. Uh, there's just no way to stop it. Um, but you can work on the neat levels. That's something that you can consci- con- you know, make a conscious effort to change. So, so that's the good thing, you know. Yeah, I think that's a cool point because you know it, it helps for folks to focus on the things that they can control and sort of let go the things that they can't. Because I mean, what's the point in worrying about it? And touching back on how somebody may have a 500 calorie decrease in NEAT when they start dieting and then going back to the the variation between people in a small room that you touched on earlier and that variation being another 500 calories, you can potentially see some massive swings between people in their daily caloric expenditure just from almost a genetic standpoint and then those uh, variations between how they respond to a diet. Yes, yes. So in your opinion, James, what are some of the best ways for folks to get more neat into, into their day-to-day lives from a practical standpoint? Uh, I'd say from a practical standpoint, again, I'd say the biggest thing is just walking around more. I mean, if you just walk at one mile per hour, which is basically the starting speed on a treadmill, <laughs> uh, so you, I mean, that's barely moving, you, you double your energy expenditure over sitting. So 
So the most efficient way to get more neat is just is just walking around more. And that could be everything from taking stairs versus escalator to um, to parking away further away from destinations to, you know, if you like to watch the TV, set up a treadmill in front of your TV, uh, um, you know, taking little walk breaks every, you know, something I used to do when I had a corporate desk job. Every hour I would take like a five-minute break and just walk around my building and come back to my desk. Um, you know, do that over eight hours. I would accumulate, you know, 35, 40 minutes of walking just doing that. Um, so there's a lot of things, a lot of ways that you can, uh, you know, get more walking into your day. And so I, I'd say that's definitely the most, probably the most efficient way to do it. Okay, cool. Now, something that I've found with my clients, and I'd be curious to know if you found the same, is getting steps in just for the sake of getting steps in can be fairly unmotivating for some folks. But pairing up, say, a task like going to get groceries or walking to the bank or something like that where there's actually an end point in place and then, and then like a task, have you found that it's easier for folks to mix in that movement that way when there's a task paired up with it? I, I haven't... I haven't really experimented that with that with my clients. It's actually that's actually um, a really good observation, though. And actually, now that you've just given me idea to, to try it with some of my clients who are maybe struggling to get their step counts up, you know. So, um, um, but that's actually a great way because I think then when you, it's a way to incorporate it into the lifestyle more, you know, um, versus. Yeah, versus just walking for the sake of walking. You know? Yeah, I find some folks find that unmotivating. Or even if it's listening to a podcast and doing some learning while they're doing it, I find it's just, I don't know, it's easier for some folks, and I find that with myself as well. It's just easier yeah. to move if I've got something to do. Yeah. So, James, we start to wrap up here, man. Can you let folks know where they can find out more about you and the awesome work you're doing? Yeah, so you can go to weightology.net. That's W-E-I-G-H-T-O-L-O-G-Y.net. Um, I have all kinds of stuff on my site. Uh, I have a research review. Uh, so anyone who's interested in the latest research in terms of uh, building muscle or losing fat, um, I have a research review that you know um, I release content. I, I try to do it on a weekly basis. Um, or, or you know, and if I don't do it on a weekly basis, I'll catch up. So by the end of the month, you know, you, you get so much content each month. Um, and it's a really nominal monthly fee. Um, but I also got a lot of free content on my site, lots of articles. I have articles on Neat that people can check out. And then also all my past, you know, podcast appearances, things like that are on there. So, you know, if you want to hear more, you mean talk more about this stuff, you know, I've also been on other podcasts and, uh, um, and then, you know, I have my online coaching and everything else. So, uh, um, and then I occasionally write just, you know, blog posts for people to read. So, so yeah, so people can check me out there. That's awesome, and I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes, and I, especially your website. There's so much great information there, so I'll link to all that stuff, and then uh, and the other podcasts that you're on as well. I'd highly recommend folks listening to. So, thanks so much for taking the time, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Okay, guys, I'll catch you on the next episode.